you're in court today for the first time, today is your arraignment. That means I'm going to tell you what the charges are against you, and I'm also going to tell you what your constitutional rights are. Each of you has the right to be represented by a lawyer at all stages of the proceedings. If you'd like some time to be able to hire a lawyer of your own choice, I'll grant you a reasonable continuance so that you can make those arrangements. If you want to be represented by a lawyer and I feel that you don't have enough money to hire one, I may then appoint the public defender to represent you. Each of you has the right to a preliminary examination within 10 court days from today's date. A preliminary examination is a hearing to determine whether or not there's probable cause to believe that the crime with which your charge has been committed and whether there's probable cause to believe that you're the person that committed that offense. With that amount of evidence is... Hello, I'm Chief Justice Ronald M. George. Like most of us involved in the courts, I am well aware of how intimidating and confusing our court system sometimes may be for others, especially for someone new to this country and unfamiliar with our system of justice. Our court system relies on the trust and confidence of all those we serve. By learning more about the backgrounds of those who come before the courts, we can better meet their needs and expectations and in turn encourage their belief in the objectivity and effectiveness of our system of justice. I hope that you will find this videotape and related materials useful, informative, and stimulating. Thank you. The countries of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos couldn't be more different than the streets of California. Many Southeast Asians are farmers living in rural villages working on family-owned rice paddies. Farmers fish to supplement their income. In the rural areas, there is little schooling, and many cannot read or write. A strong moral obligation to help and protect each other binds families together. All morality begins with loyalty to the family, then to the village, and then to the country. Traditional Asian values include an unquestioning respect for authority. Self-discipline and self-control are emphasized. In fact, it's considered shameful to be open, showy, straightforward, or aggressive. Compare that to the California lifestyle and we begin to see the cultural struggles facing Southeast Asian refugees. In 1975, um, Pol Pot came into power and he wanted to get rid of all the intelligent people and so he was hunting all the intelligent looking people, people with big forehead, wearing glasses and different things. Um, my father held the positions of a superintendent of the school and he separated all of us just in case if the family ever being caught and get slaughtered, one of the family member could survive the, um, the killing. In 1979, when the Vietnamese invasions, it gave us a window opportunity to escape the country so we can have a better life. And we escaped one at a time. And after we united at the camp, we found sponsors to sponsor us to come to the United States. And in August of um, 1981, we finally came to a new home in America. The Vietnam War did more than disrupt life in the United States. It had a devastating effect on Vietnam and the surrounding countries, a destructive legacy that would live on for decades. When the war ended in 1975, many Vietnamese, Laotian, Hmong, and Cambodian, like the Kiu family, found themselves scrambling for refuge. Because they had assisted the U.S. during the war, naturally we opened our doors and provided sanctuary. In the following decades, millions of Southeast Asians continued to attempt escape from inevitable persecution in their homelands. Some made it, many did not. Those who made it to the U.S. arrived with little more than their strong family structure and tightly held cultural traditions and values. Many, however, were ill-equipped for survival in the United States. The Southeast Asian population has become California's fastest growing population and represents the single largest group of refugees ever to enter the U.S. Today, more than one million Southeast Asians reside in California. Naturally, this dramatic influx of Southeast Asians into California has had an impact on our courts. Something as commonplace as a traffic accident can jumpstart an array of cultural complexities inside and out of the courtroom. You know, I'm having a hard time understanding you. Can you can you talk a little bit slower and tell me what happened? Yeah, I uh, I'm driving uh, my car from this way, go to this way, I go over here, and when I come over here, the gentleman car. Stop. Hold, hold on, hold on, just, just a second. Sam 85, I'm not able to respond to that right now. Do you have a Chinese interpreter that can assist me on this accident? 
Officer, it's my new Lexus. This Chinese guy can't even see over the steering wheel, okay? No wonder he rammed into me. His feet don't even reach the pedals. I am not Chinese. I am Vietnamese. Vietnamese. What I'm going to do is, is take your names down and we'll get an officer to come over and investigate. I don't have an interpreter here. Uh, hopefully we'll have somebody available in the next I day or two to help I you. I cannot understand, huh? Okay. So I need the, the interpreter to come to help me. Well, he, he explained it to me and I think I have an understanding. He was, he was going down the road and he said you just rear-ended him. Okay. Is that pretty much what happened or? Yeah, okay. Okay. Unfortunately, what Hao Tran didn't realize is that his encounter with California law enforcement had just begun. Since the officer wasn't able to get his statement, Hao Tran was assigned fault for the car accident. He now must attend traffic court. Hi, may I help you? We would like to take care of this ticket. Whose ticket is this? It's my it's uncle. Me. Would you like to pay for it today? Yes. Okay, so do you'd like to post bail to forfeit? Yes, he would like to be done with it today. Okay, that would be one. However, Mr. Tran isn't going to be done with it. He'll be back in court soon because the other driver in the accident has decided to sue him. Mr. Tran, Mr. Johnson claims you were at fault during the accident of October 3rd. Oh no, yes, I already took care of that. Do you agree you were at fault? during the incident of October 3rd? Yes, yes. In fact, Mr. Tran is not agreeing Tran. that he was at fault in the accident, but his response is not surprising. Shogunai, accept your fate. In traditional Southeast Asian culture, if you're uncertain of your proper role, you adopt a passive subordinate position. This role, combined with the language barrier, oftentimes stands in the way of truth. They speak some English but because they don't want to say in front of people, say, oh, you need translator, or you don't understand what we mean. Usually men, they have pride too, you know, like they are men, why they say not understand. Sometimes they feel embarrassed. They understand some, but maybe they lose, only one, two words can, can lose a lot of meaning. So all kind of question, so they say yes, say yes, you know, they understand, or so they nod their head or something. But sometimes it's really not fully, they understand what it means. Maybe they come back and ask him, what does this mean? You know, what do they say? It's uh, contrary to what we're, we're being pressured to do because we're being pressured to get rid of our cases, to get the calendar finished, to uh, get through a stack of files and, and get on with uh, other cases. Uh, but I think you just have to slow down. You just have to uh, allow for the fact that there are several problems. Some of them are cultural, some of them are linguistic, some of them are just the, the fact that they're in a court and they associate from their history as refugees uh, the government with the court, uh, because in many countries the uh, court is simply an instrument uh, to uh, uh, enforce the, the government's wishes. And so in that context, you just have to slow down uh, and ask lots of questions and uh, let them respond in their own time. The lack of eye contact has been another cultural hurdle in the interest of justice. I had an experience uh, when I was sitting out of juvenile court several years ago and I felt uh, subsequently become very embarrassed about it. What was happening is we had an Asian young man who um, uh, was coming before the court. I don't recall the exact incident why the young man was there, but he was before the court and I was trying to talk to him about his case and the young man would not look me in the eye and he kept looking straight down at the table and I may have been a little bit short uh, at that time as far as my temperament and I, I got upset with the young man and I said young man I would expect that you would look me in the eye when I talk to you. Years ago you know under the uh, kingship or the monarchy usually uh, uh, the uh, uh, normal people or average people cannot look in the face of uh, the superior even the king so that you know like uh, make people the same attitude, you know, in the court, you know, usually looking to the judge sitting in the chair, you know, look like a very formal, look like king, and then they, sometimes they don't look in the, the face of the judge. And sometimes misunderstanding, misconception right there. They said, maybe you try to find a way and to lie us or maybe something, you know. And from that experience, I realized that by looking down, he was actually being very respectful and not being disrespectful in any regard. And that a lot of Southeast Asian younger people, when they are being talked to by 
uh, an adult or an authority figure actually will look down as opposed to looking you in the eye as we are taught in the United States when you ha look at an adult or somebody with authority. My parents always said look them in the eye when they're talking to you. So this is something that we need to be very sensitive to. Even a smile may mean something different than it traditionally does to Americans. Depending on the situation, Southeast Asians may use a smile as a substitute for thank you or I'm sorry. It may also mean embarrassment or reluctance to answer a question. One of the things that I've noticed uh, that I find to be significant is that <clears throat> when communicating with Southeast Asians or watching them testify, they have a tendency to smile a great deal uh, just when they're answering questions or just when they're communicating, sometimes accompanied with a nod of the head as if they're agreeing with your, what you're saying, but they're, they're smiling an awful lot. Just, uh, just, uh, uh, they're very good communicators from that standpoint, very courteous communicators. But what that does sometimes, it, it conveys the wrong impression, I believe. Uh, they might be completely disagreeing with what you're asking or what you're saying, but just because of their culture or because of the way they've been brought up, that looks like they're agreeing with you by smiling and having this, uh, this uh, good expression on their face. When I ask questions uh, on the witness stand, I've noticed that at times they might be given an equivocal answer or, or not be evasive, but just sort of they would answer the question, but not be very straightforward sometimes. And you discover later on after more probing and more questioning that they adamantly disagreed with what they were being asked. They had a just a completely contrary position when that might not have been your first impression when uh, they were asked the question, just because of the manner in which they communicate. Courtroom interpretations can also be a challenge. The lack of certified Southeast Asian court interpreters means that litigants must often postpone their court hearing until an interpreter is available, or settle for an interpreter that's not versed in their own particular language. Anne Malavong explains the typical scenario that compelled her to become a courtroom interpreter. Sometimes they had a, they said Lao Shen, but they bring the Hmong or bring us somebody else they speak a little bit loud, then I don't understand what they talk about. They complain, they said, well, I go to the court, I don't understand what they talk about, you know, I just accept it, I just admit that what I'm doing, what they're saying. Complicating matters further is that most legal terms don't have a direct translation in Southeast Asian languages. An unqualified interpreter can become confused and deliver a poor interpretation that ultimately hurts the defendant. Such obstacles continue the judicial struggle. Understanding that appearing in court is contrary to the essence of the Southeast Asian way helps put into perspective the demeanor with which Southeast Asians approach the courts. In fact, Vietnamese culture has a proverb, it is unfortunate to appear oneself at the court. Vô phúc đạo tụng đình. In general, Southeast Asians are quiet, private people. Their dignity and strength is found in restraint. Control of emotions is highly praised. They do not share their personal problems with outsiders. For Southeast Asians, going to court carries a stigma and remains the last resort. Sylvana Kurt explains that it is shameful to discuss private matters in public. Yeah, yeah, yeah your dirty laundry, that's what it means, you know? So, uh, and also it brings shame to the, your family that you are bad breed, so that why you always go to the court, you know? It's always negative that you go to the court. It's not, even though we are, I, of course, I'm a victim of something and I take people to the court. They look at me, it's not a victim. They look at me as a bad person that created that problem. So that, well, that's why we do not want to go to the court because it's a shame. Another detour in the interest of justice occurs when witnesses are asked to testify. Southeast Asian family members are often reluctant to reveal information that could bring dishonor to the family. Vietnamese people have a very strong family tie. The worst thing for a man or woman is to denounce a relative a suspect of a crime. And so, many Southeast Asians will avoid court at all costs. Sometimes that means pleading guilty to a crime they did not commit. Anything to limit their time in the courtroom. When making a decision, Southeast Asians feel strongly about consulting their family. Gathering at the University of the Pacific, Southeast Asian community leaders shared with us their cultural mores for this project. The Hmong people uh, are family-oriented, you know, family or uh, group decision. When someone uh, commit criminal, uh, that person would be blunt, you know, uh, uh, doesn't know how to say yes or no or can't make decisions. So a lot of time 
We need uh, mother, father there. We need brother, sister, uncle, uh, people that elderly that will also be able to help guide or make decisions. It is not unusual to see the litigant arrive in court accompanied by family members. A decision can't and often won't be made by the individual because it's family first, self second. Allowing the litigant to consult family members may result in a more informed decision. The problems facing the Vietnamese, Cambodians, Hmongs and Laotians in the courtroom are similar. However, you can be sure these cultures are quite distinct from one another. For instance, each has their own language. Identifying a Cambodian as a Vietnamese and vice versa could be greatly offensive and could cause a setback in the courtroom. Referring to court documents and speaking with the defense attorney for proper pronunciation of the defendant's name prior to entering the courtroom can save a lot of time and grief during the trial. How tram. California judges not only have full dockets, tight schedules, and a flurry of new laws to continually keep pace with, but with our state's ever-broadening ethnic mix, they must also keep up with the myriad of cultural variations from California's diverse population. In summary, when Southeast Asians are in court, judges may have to remember that a lack of eye contact is out of respect. A smile may mean, I'm sorry, thank you, or simply a reluctance to reply. And perhaps most difficult of all, don't accept yes for yes I understand. When handling cultural differences, consider the fact that equal treatment is not always fair. Equal treatment simply is that we treat everyone the same. Uh, fair treatment uh, re really reflects uh, what we do um, as judicial officers, as uh, court employees, in terms of a person comes before us, that we want to make sure they leave feeling good about the services that they, that they receive. H however, uh, to make sure that we're treating everyone equally, uh, we have to take into account some of the differences that people bring in uh, to the courthouse. For example, they bring in their cultural background, their history, and they bring in their perspectives and worldviews. And when we take those into account, then equality means something very different than fairness. Indeed, moving to the United States provided many Southeast Asians with a new life. But coming here has meant giving up much more than their homeland. It's been a struggle, and at times heartbreaking due to the changes in family dynamics and lifestyle. A fishing in the lake, for example, there is no such thing that to get a license in, uh, in Laos. If you was in Laos, there's no license. If you want to catch fish, you catch fish. If you want to hunting, you just go hunting. Here, we have to have a license. We have to get the permit uh, from the uh, you know, uh, authority here. Yes, I believe that. But before they do that, uh, we specifically, the Southeast Asian community, we should be more educated from the court system with here. Judges throughout California have seen their share of Southeast Asians in court for fishing without a license. In Southeast Asian countries, Same fishing, fishing is part of the daily today? routine of survival. A license bag? is unheard of. Fishing in Cambodia is not a game. Actually, you know, people, because people traditionally and, you know, think like fishing as the mean of uh, making a living and to support a family. Imagine their surprise when they cast a line into California waters and end up catching hundreds of dollars worth of fines. And the home life for many Southeast Asians hasn't been any easier. Children tend to learn English and adjust more quickly than their parents. They may pick up American children's tendency to question their parents and teachers, which is considered highly disrespectful in Southeast Asian culture. They are pulled further and further away from their once indestructible family unit. Southeast Asians' strict child-rearing philosophies have landed many parents in the court system accused of child abuse. According to Vietnamese culture, discipline must be maintained in the family circle in order to achieve peace and harmony. When a child misbehaves, the corporal punishment inflicted by the parent is aimed at making him better. A very popular Vietnamese saying is, If you love your child, you, uh, you give him some spanking. But if you uh, hate him, let him go play to become a little for the rest of his life a bad guy. Once in the U.S. school system, Southeast Asian children quickly learn about our strict child abuse laws, and some children will warn their parents that they may go to jail if they hit them. Some parents become intimidated to the point of abandoning the role of parent. 
We have seen that within the Hmong community, a lot of children have used this against their parents, whereas they might want to go out with their friends, they might want to do something that their parents won't approve of, but uh, the parents can't really do anything to them, so the parents, have, the parents feel like they have no control. If Child Protective Services is called, the social worker often must get the story from the English-speaking child. The parents are then at the mercy of their disgruntled child. Once in the court, as we've seen with Hao Tran and the car accident scene, the Southeast Asian refugee struggle continues. We're attempting to ease that struggle. Some possible solutions that have surfaced during research for this project are... Speak slowly, because they understand, but it just take, take time, because many bilingual people who are really not fluent in English, they, 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 they still translate in their mind when they listen to the English, they have to translate back to their own language and then they, they translate back to the English before they can speak. We need uh, mother, father there, we need brother, sister, uncle, uh, people that are elderly that will also be able to help guide or make decision. The document should be uh uh, translated in a written document and show, you know, so that people can see, like, uh, how you want to plead, guilty or not guilty or uh, no, no, no contest. And actually people just could not understand anything at all right there. It's something that judges should probably include in their uh, explanation to everybody present when you start a, a criminal proceeding or, or a civil proceeding for that matter. Before any trial, we have a checklist. I have a checklist of things that I go over for everybody present. And it'd probably be a good idea to have that on a checklist as a judge to tell the interpreters if there's something that comes up, let me know if there's a word that you don't understand. Uh, if, the, if the individual looks like they're having some difficulty understanding it, please let me know and we can go back over it. Give chance to uh, people to uh, get educated, you know, more training on uh, what the legal system here, you know, work about that because this kind of uh, a lot of things uh, uh, relate to culture stuff. Uh, give orientation to all the client uh, prior to uh, the real uh, court date or the arraignment or something like that so that they can understand clearly. And that's just what the Superior Court of San Joaquin County has done. Realizing that the Southeast Asian community needs to be more informed about our courts, an innovative program has been created to educate Southeast Asians and other ethnic groups on the U.S. judicial system. The Court and Community Leadership and Liaison Program is a 12-week course covering the fundamentals of criminal law as well as small claims, traffic, family law, domestic violence, and juvenile court. Our system of justice is based a lot on the confidence level that people have that the right thing is going to be done or it's good, that things are going to be done for particular reasons, reasons that are not arbitrary but that are based on some rule of law. And so if we are in a position of giving people information about how we work, kind of opening ourselves up to them and letting them see why we do the things we do and at the same time answering their questions if they have them, then that helps uh, hopefully build confidence that people have as it relates to the justice system in their particular community. It's very helpful for, my, for, for myself and also mostly to my community so I can provide to my community. So like I mentioned, so they're not afraid because most of my cultures, they, they're afraid of the Court, to come to the court when they see the paper from courts, they so afraid and they scared. So, <laughs> so they might be because they they heard that court might be in jail or something. So, that's what is so try to provide to them. The court and community leadership and liaison program has also been instrumental in keeping the courts in touch with community concerns and cultural differences. One of the things that I learned was that they had some complaints about the statutory rape laws that are on the books because that conflicts with their cultural traditions. And that is very common for young girls to get married at the age of 14 or 15 in their cultures to older men. Um, and then the men often get accused of statutory rape when it's in a legitimate marriage for purposes of their culture. Um, so I've actually had some statutory rape cases that fall within that category after having that information. Um, where the, the young man had a you know, good job in mid-twenties and married in their community, even though it wasn't a legal marriage, it was religious in their community, a 14 or 15 year old girl, and to have a prosecutor argue to me um, that somehow this is a sexual predator. Now having that information about that being common in, in the way the culture do, does the business, so to speak, or does their relationships, um, it was able to allow me to look at the case from a much more knowledgeable perspective 
about the cultures and how they handle th and how they handle things, um, and was able to relay that to the prosecutor. Um, and that individual wound up pleading to a misdemeanor uh, statutory rape um, conviction as opposed to a felony, mostly because of stuff that I had learned in terms of, of how that relationship is different um, and how that might not be a sexual predator, but more likely be a legitimate husband within their community, just not one that the laws of the state of California had gone through. The court and community leadership and liaison program has become a bridge between the judicial system and the community and has been so successful in Stockton, it may be replicated in other cities throughout the nation. Despite the Southeast Asian struggle to find their way through our unfamiliar courts, they're very appreciative of the U.S. justice system. I think it is uh, one of the greatest uh, systems in the world and I believe, I strongly believe that it is uh, fair for everybody and I have a good faith in it. I encourage you to discuss what you have learned with your colleagues and to think about how you might apply it in your particular role. I strongly believe that by learning about the different cultural, ethnic, and racial groups that come into our courts, we create a better court system for all, and I thank you for participating in this program. <music>